So these issues all start becoming together. And if you tie them in a knot, I'm now saying that we can no longer guarantee the security of supply in the non-urban areas. So this is quite a big discussion. Is South Africa at risk of fuel shedding? Well, joining me to discuss is Peter Morgan. He is the director of the Liquid Fuels Wholesalers Association. Peter Morgan, welcome to the show. Good day, thank you. So, Peter, you've been warning about the risk to the strategic fuel supply stocks and the possibility that we could have uh, potential problems with supply in the future. Could you tell us more about your association and, and where you're seeing this risk emerging? The Liquid Fuels Wholesalers Association was set up to look after the interests of the new independent fuel wholesalers. It was set up just on 10 years ago, and that is our prime focus, is, is, to, is to really support and, and, to, and to carry a mandate from members to make the changes in this country to enable them to, be, to become profitable and to stay profitable, to look after their bottom line. That's what we're about. Okay, so you're not representing the big oil majors, the BPs and Shells and those kind of organizations? No, no, they have their own association. And it's important to know that we don't trade in any way. We're a lobby group. We do not trade. Our members trade. We don't. All right. So Thomas, what are you seeing with regards to the, the mm -hmm. strategic fuel stocks? You see, if you talk about strategic fuel stocks, I will tell you now that we have none. We used to have about 30 days of crude in Soldana. Soldana is a, is a crude oil storage. It has a pipeline that goes directly into the refinery in Cape Town. That refinery had a fire some 18 months, two years ago, and it's, it's still not refining again. So at the moment, we have no crude oil stocks, strategic stocks. And I'm also saying to you that we, we've gone from a country that was an, a, a refinery-driven economy to one now that has an import of finished product-driven economy. Now, what we've learned is that over the last 18 months, that when you import finished products, it introduces a number of new risks to, this, to the supply chain that we didn't have with the crude oil. So we've got no crude oil stocks. What we know is that the oil majors import, and they import just in time, and they import just enough. And we know that because we're between three weeks and six weeks on the water at any given time, depending who we're importing finished products from, then a number of things can go wrong. You can have delays in the shipping, you can have product that gets off spec while it's on water. You can have bad weather at the ports, so your you vessel can get you in time. And then the, the, it can't get into berth because of bad weather. What we do know is that the oil companies watch their imports very carefully. So that if they see there's going to be any constraint anywhere in their business, they will keep the product that they need for themselves, and they will ration their independent wholesale. So what we're really saying is you're keeping the product for the oil companies who trade in the urban areas and you're rationing the independent wholesalers who trade in the non-urban areas. So there's your first distinction. We, we're putting the non-urban areas and what we used to call the old rural uh, areas at risk of non-supply because when, when, when there's a shortage of any vessel that doesn't arrive on time, we know that they don't have any strategic stocks because immediately we feel that pressure when we get rationed. So there's your first crunch point when it comes to strategic stocks and future situations of whether we're going to have product or not. All right, so this rural urban distinction is because of the distribution systems, is that correct? It's because the current pricing methodology has an average on it. So in the urban areas, there's an over recovery. And that's why the oil majors have kept that area and trade there. They, they have sold off or walked away from all the non-urban areas because there's an under-recovery in the price, pricing methodology. They've sold off to, to new entrants, to independent wholesalers, and that's where the crunch is coming, and that's why there's two different trading areas. And, and the message from, between us to government to get that recognized hasn't happened the way I would have liked to have happened. The message doesn't seem to be getting across. And why do you think that is? I think that's because government have got so used to talking to the oil industry when they talk liquid fuel matters, that w when we raise our hands and say, but we're different, I, I, we, that, I, I don't know why it's not getting across, but it's not getting across. We've been trying now for, for probably eight years, and, and it's not getting across, so there's something I'm not doing right. 
All right, Peter. Well, just in terms of some of the second order risks that could emerge here, I mean, if there is a lack of supply of fuel in rural areas, that could impact the agricultural sector, uh, long, long haul uh, transport, uh, the trucks uh, are, are what move most goods in South Africa nowadays. So uh, do you see that those two sectors could be impacted? You see, those, those are the two big concerns. And you know, construction companies out in these areas, busing companies, transport companies, they all need product. Our, our economy runs on, on liquid fuels. But, but for me, it's a little bit bigger. There, there, there appears to be a lack of understanding that the current pricing methodology was fine when one company was doing it all because they had the swings and the roundabout scenario. When you have one company that's doing half and, and a whole new group of, of entrants to an industry that's doing the other half, these pricing methodology concerns become barriers to entry. I mean, I'll give you a few examples. If you look at, at uh, the fuel price change between January and this month, we've had price increases we've never seen before. The current price methodology doesn't recognize it. Okay, we, we had a strange situation in May this year. Once a year, we get uh, the, the, the fuel price to get it from the coast inland comes on a thing called the zone. Starts at zone one, goes up to zone nine in Gauteng, and it goes further up until it gets to the northern borders. Zone 9C gets a pipeline cost adjustment every year. All the other zones get one that's done by the department themselves. So the pipeline got a margin increase this year. The information that was given to the department this year was wrong. The department used the wrong information. They, they've admitted that the information was wrong and it's been corrected. They've got the correct information, but the pricing methodology hasn't been changed. So we, we, we've got a situation where the pricing methodology doesn't reflect the reality on the ground. So, so we're worried about having uh, no strategic stock, which means that every time there's a shortage at the start of the chain, uh, that's the first whammy we have. We have cost increases that are not being recognized. We have real decreases that we've been faced with that, where there should have actually been increases. So these issues all start becoming together. And if you tie them in a knot, I'm now saying that we can no longer guarantee the security of supply in the non-urban areas. So this is quite a big discussion. If we don't get strategic stocks that we need, and the issue about strategic stocks is about the cost of them. I mean, why the Morani Commission of 2006 said we need 90 days. I don't know about the 90 days, but I'm saying we need at least 30 days of finished stock in a strategic stock in the right place, which is probably Gauteng. If we haven't got that and we don't get alignment between the reality on the ground and what's happening in the pricing methodologies, then, you know, we, we've asked ourselves the question, what happens next? Market forces happen next. Things get forced to change. So, you know, we say we're in a, in a regulated industry for petrol. We're getting to the stage now we're saying that that, that market forces may change that in the very near future, that we're going to have to start reconsidering that ourselves. Would you be in favor of liberalizing the cost of liquid fuels? We, we've all agreed that, that we need to deregulate this industry. And, and you're using a nice word when you talk about liberalizing. We need to say, you know, we're going to deregulate. Because deregulate means there's a bloodbath. It means there's a massive closure. I mean, if you look at what happened in Australia and New Zealand and, and United Kingdom, they lose 70% of their service stations in the first two years. So I, I've heard people in government saying, we will keep the law in place that says you can't have self-service. If you lose 70% of re your retail sites, that's where the blood, lo blood loss is. It's not about keeping the game. So, so we, I'm getting to the stage now where I say, if you can't regulate properly, then it's better to, to deregulate properly. And let's take the pain now, because we can't live with a situation where we're not regulating properly. That's the bottom line, what I'm talking to now. So we're saying to government, you, you, want to de you want to regulate, you must regulate properly. If you can't regulate properly, then we must start opening the discussion about deregulating properly. That means no more licenses for retail site. That means no more anything. It means you open the floodgates and you say, guys, let the strong survive. Because what happens is you get rationalization at the wholesale side of the business. Everybody thinks that deregulation happens to the fuel retailer. And what is he going to do to his pump price? That's not the first step to deregulation. I mean, a classic example is Brazil. 
two oil companies, one on the East Coast, one on the West Coast, both transporting fuels across the country. They draw a line from north to south, and, and one swaps his retail network in the, in the east to the guy in the west and, and vice versa. And all of a sudden, they halve their distribution costs overnight. That's where you start to see deregulation happen. Everybody thinks go to the fuel retail and say, how are you going to cut your bump price? They don't have margins there to cut bump prices. Half of them don't even own the, the, the assets, the pumps, the tanks, the property. So all they're working on is an, is an op cost. A, a, a one rand 20 op cost of which 66 cents is wages. Where are you going to cut from there? You, you can't run a business with, you know, fractions of a cent maybe if you're a big pump. That's not where the price changes. You have rationalization through the wholesale network, and that's where the change comes. And then you'll see a very, very different industry in South Africa. Peter Morgan, thank you very much. Let's hand over to you, our audience. Do you think that South Africa's fuel supplies are at risk? Leave your thoughts down in the comment section. Also, if you enjoyed this analysis, you might want to consider becoming a client of the CRA. There's a link in the description below where you can find out more information. We have a range of client reports and other services which you may find helpful for navigating through the uncertain times in South Africa. My name is David Ansara. This is the CRA. Until next time, take care.